call forward the Archdiocese and Byzantine Choir forward now and chant for us the Apolitikion of the three hierarchs. We are here tonight as a result of an argument. You know, some 900 years ago, hard as it may be to believe, in the city of Constantinople, there were a series of student uprisings of a very peculiar nature. It seems that the bright young men studying in that city were at odds with one another over which of the great 4th century fathers of the church, Basil the Great, the Archbishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia, his friend Gregory, former Archbishop of Constantinople, and John Chrysostom, another former Archbishop of Constantinople, as to which of these three was in fact the greatest. It wasn't until he had communicated that vision 
to others that calm was restored in the city. And around the year 1100, at the direction of the Emperor Alexius I Komnenos, January 30th was established as a common feast day for these great fathers. Even though each of them has a feast day in the course of the month of January, St. Basil's on the 1st, St. Gregory the Theologian on the 25th, St. John Chrysostom, the return of his relics from exile to the city of Constantinople on January 27th. Even though they were each honored separately, the Pepper established a common day of uh, their commemoration to stress their um, equality in the sight of God. And I can think of no better speaker to help us commemorate this feast this evening than his beatitude, Archbishop Anastasios of Tirana, Duras, and all Albania. In his person, we see combined the gifts of these three great hierarchs. We see the administrative genius of St. Basil in his uh, groundbreaking work in Africa and more recently in Albania. We, in his writings, encounter the theological sensitivity of Gregory the theologian. His pastoral heart is as powerfully motivated as was that of St. John Chrysostom. So he is the perfect person to uh, help us recognize the, the way these three gifts complement each other and work together for the glory of God. His uh, deanship at the theological uh, school in Athens, his uh, establishment of the, uh, the uh, seminary in Kenya, his ordaining of over a hundred priests and uh, lay leaders for the Church of East Africa, uh, the, the building of churches, of over 150 churches during his tenure there, his crucial work in the resurrection of the, of the uh, Orthodox Autocephalous Church of Albania since the fall of communism in 1990. His, have, he's served since 1992 as that church's uh, archbishop and has overseen the establishment of some 400 parishes uh, in the course of that time. And this is from a country that had been for decades officially atheistic and intolerant of any religious expression. To have a place in the heart of Tirana uh, of, uh, a, a testimony uh, to orthodoxy in, in, the, in stone and, and, and art in, in the a remarkable cathedral of the resurrection which was uh, opened last summer and which will be consecrated this coming summer. Uh, his, his achievements are uh, humbling really uh, and, and in my personal relationship with his beatitude I marvel at the fact that he accomplished as much as he did because his person is such a gentle and meek person. And one would think that to achieve these kinds of things, one would have to be forceful and powerful in a worldly sense. But no, he manages to achieve these things while not diminishing, uh, while not compromising the spirit of meekness and holiness that should characterize uh, Orthodox leadership. Um, I look forward to the publication of two books in the months to come, one which will focus on his achievements in Albania and the other his achievements in Africa. And uh, both of them, uh, I'm sure, will be um, inspirational and illuminating uh, to all of us. And so without further ado, I call to the podium his, his beatitude. Archbishop Anastasios. The topic of his presentation this evening is Aligned with the Fathers, the Dynamic Tradition of the Three Hierarchs. Your Beatitude.
Μιώτε Τερ, Αγία Μερική Σκύρια Δημήτρη, προσφυλέστετε αδελφέ και θα έλεγα συνοδοιπόρο για 68 χρόνια. Σεβασμιώτε τη, θεοφυλέστε τη, δεν μπορώ όλα τα ονόματα να τα επαναλάβω, λέω όπως είπαν οι προηγούμενοι, για να κερδίσουμε λίγο χρόνο. Κύριε Πρέσβης, κύριε εκπρόσωποι της κοινότητας, θα έλεγα πολύ πιο λιτά και πολύ πιο ουσιαστικά προσφυλέστετη αδελφή και αδελφέ μου. Πραγματικά βρίσκουμε με πολύ συγκίνηση σε αυτόν εδώ τον χώρο. Δεν ήταν αρχικά προγραμματισμένο, αλλά η επιμονή του αδελφού μου πάντοτε ήταν για μένα καθοδηγητική και είπα σύμφωνη, θα γίνει. Και πραγματικά νιώθω μια ιδιαίτερη ευλογία αυτή τη στιγμή που είμαι μαζί σας απόψε. Οι προηγούμενοι οι οποίοι μίλησαν νομίζω με την αγάπη τους και την καλοσύνη τους έβαλαν ένα φακό και μεγάλωσαν από όλα πράγματα. Ευχαριστώ θερμότατα τον προσφυλέστα του αδελφό κύριο Σάβα, Μητροπολίτη Πίτσπουργ και τον κύριο Ευθυμιόπουλο για τις αναφορές που έκανα στο ταπεινό προσωπό μου απλώς για λόγους αλήθειας γιατί εμείς όσοι έχουμε ασχοληθεί λίγο με τα πανεπιστημιακά θέλουμε να είμαστε ακριβείς η ακριβή διατύπωση είναι ότι ο Μιλών είναι ένα μικρό καντήλι μόνο μπροστά στι εικόνε των τριών ιεραρχών, τίποτε άλλο. Και προσπαθούμε βεβαίω να εμπνεόμαστε από τα νεανικά μα χρόνια, από το δικό του το παράδειγμα, διότι εκείνο το οποίο πάντοτε με συγκινούσε είναι η σύνθεση. Δεν ήταν απλώ η σοφή, δεν ήταν απλώ η δυναμική, δεν ήταν απλώ η ασκητική. Δεν ήταν απλώ εκείνοι που αγαπούσαν βαθύτατα το Θεό, ήταν εκείνοι οι οποίοι τα συνέδεταν όλα αυτά σε μια υπέροχη σύνθεση και μια άνεση εκπληκτική για τον κόσμο. Θυμάμαι πάντοτε αυτή την υπέροχη φράση την οποία έλεγε ο Μέγας Βασίλειος «Οουν απολέσες την προς τον Θεό ομοιότητα, απόλυσε την προς τη ζωή οικειότητα». Ήταν πάντα μπροστά μα και εμείς προσπαθούσαμε απλώς να επιθυμίσουμε και στον εαυτό μας και στους αγαπημένους μας ανθρώπους τι τεράστια σημασία έχει να έχουμε αυτούς οδηγούς και όχι άλλους. I shall start with a very short introduction in Greek. I shall repeat this in English. Sometimes I shall say some Greek phrases and at the end also a very small summary in Greek and English. Η επανάσταση η κοινωνική και πνευματική που θα έσωσε τον κόσμο έλεγε ένας από τους αντιπάλους του Ευαγγελίου ο γνωστός Γάλλος Κλεμανσό θα γινόταν όταν οι χριστιανοί αποφάσιζαν αληθινά να ζήσουν τον χριστιανισμό τους. Ολονότι η διάθεσή του ήταν σαρκαστική, ο λόγος του είναι φορτωμένος με αλήθεια. Δεν φτάνει όμως μια απόφαση, όπως έλεγε, για να ζήσει κανείς σαν Χριστό. Οι περιοχές της πνευματικής ζωής είναι δύσβατες και χρειάζονται καθοδήγηση και κόπο. Ειδικότερα στα χρόνια μας που μια ιδιαίτερη σύγχυση και νευρικότητα σαν ομίχλη πυκνή πλακώνει την καρδιά και τον νου. Στην κρίσιμη αυτή πορεία, η ιδανική οδηγή προς ανέβρεση του Θεού, του ανθρώπου, προς κατανόηση του κόσμου που εξελίσσεται τα διάκοπα και του εαυτού μας, παραμένουν και σήμερα οι τρεις μέγιστοι φωστήρες της Τρισιλίου Θεότητος, τους οποίους εξ αρχής η Ορθόδοξη Ανατολή θεώρησε ως Θεοφθόγκους κήρυκες, την κορυφή των διδασκάλων. Ο λόγος για τον οποίο η Εκκλησία προβάλλει τους τρεις αυτούς ιεράρχες ως οικουμενικούς διδασκάλους είναι ακριβώς το ότι κατόρθωσαν να ενσαρκώσουν κάτι πολύ σπουδαιότερο από τον τύπο του απλού σοφού, του απλού οσίου ή ασκητή του απλού κοινωνικού εργάτη. Κατόρθωσαν να πραγματοποιήσουν και να μας αφήσουν υπόδειγμα 
τον τύπο του ολοκληρωμένου, του καινού ανθρώπου, ο οποίος ζει πραγματικά τον Χριστό και αξιοποιεί πλήρως την δωρεά του Αγίου Πνεύματος. Η ουσιαστικότερη λοιπόν προσέγγιση στο πνεύμα στην καρδιά, τη βούλησή τους, μπορεί να αποδειχθεί σωτήρια για μας που ως επιτοπλίστων αποσπασματικά ζούμε το Ευαγγέλιο υπογραμμίζοντας πότε το ένα και πότε το άλλο. The exact title of this address is in line with the fathers the dynamic understanding of their own tradition, life in Christ. The domains of spiritual life and difficulty are difficult, requiring guidance and struggle. This is especially true in our times when confusion presses on our hearts and minds. In this vital journey, the three hierarchs, whom the Orthodox East has always regarded as divinely speaking, prove ideal guides in our guest quest for God, for our fellow men and ourselves. The reason why the Orthodox Church presents these three hierarchs as ecumenical <coughs> is because they embodied much more than the mere image of a sage, ascetic or social worker. Rather, they achieve and bestow to us on us the model of the fulfilled new human being who lives truly in Christ and realizes the gift of the Holy Spirit. I shall try to limit myself to four only points. Although the tradition is three points, I make a little revolution to four. Bringing our phronema in line with the fathers. Στη γραμμή των πατέρων, αφομοιώνοντας το δικό τους φρόνημα, το δικό τους τρόπο σκέψης. This is, of course, not men uh, that it is a repetition of their words. The problem is, how shall we be able to acquire the phronema, the mind, the way of thinking of the fathers? Father George Florovsky clarifies the matter, criticizing, criticizing the era of theology that lost the patristic line of thought and rendered the patristic works into inner documents, he concluded, quote, it means very little to know the patristic writings and extract from them references or arguments. Rather, one must comprehend the theology of the Fathers from within. In this case, spiritual intuition far more important, is far more important than profound knowledge. Because only intuition can revitalize the texts and elicit from them a material. Only from within can one detect an all-embracing witness and distinguishes from what is merely theological opinion, assumption, interpretation or theory, end of quote. It is not enough then to know the solutions that the fathers gave to this or that problem in their age. A revival of the patristic way of thinking does not imply slavish imitation, memorization or repetition. It signifies creativity, bold confrontation of life's emerging problems on the basis of a Christocentric view of the whole world and human being with the mind of Christ. The fathers avoid oversimplifications. When they speak or write on a given subject, you have the feeling that it has engaged them seriously. 
their profound reflection on humanity's innermost aspirations and the frequent return to a life of silence and ascesis is indicative of their spiritual inclination to seek a genuine and spiritual vision and judgment in Christ. Much has been said and written about the amazing combination of the spirit of Christianity with that of the classical Greek civilization. And before we had the opportunity to hear some very important remarks. This synthesis was successfully realized by the three hierarchs. This was a critical problem in their day and its solution required great daring, freedom from bias and clarity of spirit. Their final synthesis is not mere conciliation or compromise, but the expression of the gospel in the philosophical and cultural language of their time. Indeed, it is the salvation and baptism of the ancient civilization. Everything good, exalted and beautiful achieved by human beings before the advent of Christ is assumed, purified and healed by the fathers, who then place it in the service of the incarnate word of God. Yet, in this way, they saved and transformed, incorporating it into the revealed truth. Furthermore, thought it is through this association and combination with Christianity, Greek philosophy is fulfilled. It ceases to be segmented. It no longer contains only grains of truth. It becomes part of the whole truth, which was revealed to humanity. The three ecumenical teachers, deeply honor philosophy and the arts, education, Gregory notes, is the first among all goods. This is true not only of our own education, which is of course the noblest, but also for secular education, which many interpret as dangerous or erroneous and as alienating from God. End of quote. For this aim, they cultivated reason as much as possible, regarding it as God's greatest gift that distinguishes humankind from the rest of creation. At the same time, presents us as priests of the entire world. Through man, creation offers worship and veneration to God. However, the fathers do not deify reason. They render its light purer and more permeating through faith. Likewise, without denouncing practical arithmetic, mathematicians promote their own thought through the algebraic, through the calculus, enabling it to handle and permeate more easily and more deeply into the essence of mathematical problems. By analogy, without being scornful, hostile or fearful towards human reason, the fathers developed and utilized all its potential. Ultimately, they transcended reason seeing and solving difficult problems on a new basis which is given to them by the redemptive work of the Lord through which humankind becomes free. Their thought moves within the dialectic of the cross under the light of the resurrection with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
thanks to a deep Christocentrism, which constitutes the essence of Christianity, their dialect acquires a unique sharpness and vigor. What they offer is not a product of books, of broad knowledge and philosophical reflection. They refine human experience through the fire of prayer, of deep spiritual focus, of personal experience. The mystery of Christ is the headlight which helps them see where we only, the others, we the others see darkness. For the fathers, dogma, and I know that many they are very skeptical about dogma, but for them is not a series of abstract metaphysical sentences, faceless truth, dwelling in some platonic heaven, beyond space and time. They are indicators, guiding arrows, pointing us to the direction of the living personal truth, namely Christ. This is why they persist in the effort to ensure that these indicators are accurate and correctly positioned. Even the slightest deviation threaten to mislead us. However, the fathers do not stop there. They personally walk the path carved. Out of those indicators, experiences the doctrines and encountering Christ not only in thought, but with their entire soul, and partaking of his mystery, mystical life within the church. In the end, they are full witnesses of the truth. Possessing the true faith, they live the true life. And living the true life, they reveal the true faith in all its beauty and splendor. My second point will be, is comfort, freedom towards the world. Άνεση και ελευθερία έναντι του κόσμου και όχι φόβο και αγωνία γι' αυτό. All that we have said about the three IRS and their understanding of dogma essentially define the way they themselves felt and lived. Usually for the fragmented Christian of our age, there is a distinguish between ideas as theoretical concepts which he or she learns and accepts, and the way of daily life. People may believe in the Christian doctrines, or at least they say that they believe, but they don't entrust their life to the light and guidance of these doctrines. Consequently, these people turned into unable to face the daily reality that changes and unable to taste the joy of the spiritual life. The exact opposite what occurs in the lives of the three hierarchs. They live what they believe with absolute consistency. The core of their theological thought is the incarnate Son and Word of God who assumed and deified human na nature in Jesus Christ. This is what constitutes the central axis of their whole experience. Everything they feel, the presence of Christ, the effects of his redemptive work. This is what gives them wonderful freedom and comfort regard to everything in this world, in this society, filling them with affection and compassion towards their fellow human beings. For the close one comes to God, the closer one also comes to humankind, to the world. He who has, this is the quote, 
he who has lost his likeness with God has also lost his familiarity with life and with God. <coughs> in the Greek original, own apolleses in προς τον Θεόν ομοιότητα, απόλεσε την προς τη ζωή οικειότητα. This is from the writings of St. Basil the Great. They knew very well that everything belongs to God, not only because everything is created by God, but also because he redemptive work of the Lord through brought into unity things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Who then is unclean? asked Saint John Chrysostom. Who is so liking in conscience and so foolish that he would blame nature? What shall we say about nature? For it is not evil, but both good and the indication of the wisdom, power, and divine philanthropy. End of quote. The three fathers paid close attention to the revealing words of St. Paul. The world and life and death and the present and the future, all are yours, and you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. This is why we see them moving with ease, within creation, within civilization in general, with the grace and freedom of the children of God. This harmony and sin, all those things that pollute many expressions of society do not make them panic or flee. On the contrary, they only intensified their responsibility towards the world, their obligations to con contribute towards the purification of all things. By the same token, this positive stance towards the value of creation does not cause them to forget tragic reality of sin, and the fact that many become attached to created things, idolizing them in one way or another. Another quote, God created the sky, says St. John Chrysostom, so that by becoming owed by it, we might bow to the Lord, yet many ignore the Creator and bowed to the creation. And all of this was the result of their indifference and folly. End of quote. This internal attitude of comfort and freedom in the fathers is of unique importance for us Christians to avoid the errors we are tempted to make, such as assuming the modern civilization is something foreign to God and thereby becoming internally divided before it, sometimes criticizing and scorning it, while at other times becoming attached to it and almost worshiping it. It is only when we embrace the various achievements and creations of the human spirit with the comfort and freedom of the children of God, just as the three hierarchs embracing classical civilization, that we shall also be able to offer a genuine Christian testimony in our times. All this technology that we enjoy in our times is not foreign from God, it is ours. We cannot leave this to the hands of David. We must use this for his glory and as for embracing all human beings. Human spirit has its origin to God. Every achievement and accomplishment also has its origin in Him and belonging to Him. To surrender them to the monopolizing exploitation of the powers of evil is not merely human error, but treason. 
for God. These achievements must be returned to their true origin and owner in order that through the grace, power and light of the crucified Lord they may be purified and offered as sacrifice to God in order to become a way of glorifying Him, His most holy name. There is an urgent need for us to move within the problems of our time, of our science, of our civilization, without phobia, phobia, who is an illness, but only with genuine fear of God, that is freedom, which is source of creativity and life. Now we are in the third point an intense awareness of kinonia, of communion, and deep love for humanity. Apart from the admiration, ad, admirable comfort, love and freedom of the three hierarchs towards everyone and everything in the world, what is also very important is the manner in which they empathized with humanity and its problems. As genuine people of God, the fathers were not of this world, they had nothing of what we may say a secular mentality. They were <coughs> nevertheless in the most essential way in the world. They lived within the turmoil and anxieties of society of their time. They had a strong sense of community. Their world was always current, lively, responding to the demands of their own time. St. John Chrysostom's characteristically reveals the patristic ideal when he writes that the priest must be as familiar with all affairs of daily life as those who live in the world. Of course, this is for the, also for the bishops to say. At the same time, however, he needs to be detached from all these things, even more so that the monk who dwell in the mountains, end of quote. Saying, of course, this, <coughs> Uh, he had in mind a special type of monks, like his disciple Saint Nilus the ascetic, who described the monk as separated from everything thing, and at the same time united with, with everything. The genuine monk regards himself as one with everyone because he sees him self in everyone, without exception, and blessed is the monk who, after God, regards all people as gods. These are phrases from the Fathers. Και στα ελληνικά θυμάμαι με πολύ συγκίνηση μια φράση η οποία νομίζω υπήρξε καθοδηγητική για πολλούς από εμάς, μακάριος ο μοναχός ότι είναι κάστου προκοπήν και σωτηρία ως ιδίαν με τα πάσης χαράς όλων. Η προκοπή και σωτηρία των άλλων δεν είναι αντικείμενο για ζήλια, αλλά είναι χαρά μας. Και αυτό είναι το μυστικό για να μπορούμε να χαιρόμαστε με τα διάφορα επιτέγματα των αδελφών μας και πραγματικά να δοξάζουμε τον Θεό για το έργο τους, όπως εγώ αισθάνομαι αυτό το χρέο εδώ στην Αμερική, για ό,τι γίνεται από τους εξαιρετικού αδελφού μου στην Αυτή και δυναμική κοινωνία. This last phrase provides the key to comprehending the Father's passion for humanity, for they saw in the face of every human person the very image of God. Quote, you are the image of God and you are conversing with the image of God, states St. Gregory. One can't scorn the image of one's fellow human being 
by exploiting him or her. Quote, God's only begotten son became human. My Lord was slaughtered and his blood was poured out for humankind. Shall be scornful. What forgiveness can I have? Asks and draw Christus. By what right then can I scorn someone whom God so honors as to offer that person the body and blood of his own son? Is this precisely the concept of communion of the presence of Christ in his faithful that leads St. John Chrysostom to this most surprising and powerful idea seeing Christ as his desire for our salvation in every suffering, poor, naked and thirsty person. For our fathers, love is something far deeper than what we use in, to imply by this term. It is the protection and the projection of the face of Christ onto the face of every suffering person. While there is still time, concludes St. Gregory, the theologian, in his passionate speech on charity, it is Christ whom we must visit, it is Christ whom we must heal, it is Christ whom we must feel, Christ whom we must clothe, it is Christ whom we must embrace, it is Christ whom we must don. The language of the Father acquires still greater vividness when it proclaims the equality and fraternity of all people. Whoever discriminates among people, declares and badly great, sees obscurely. The real atheist and thieves are those who amass treasures at the expenses of others, those who keep their riches exclusively for their own benefit, and St. John Chrysostom. Not hesitate to describe slavery as fullness, vlakia, this is the, the word that he used, vlakia, and characterize the use of wealth for personal interest as equivalent to plundering. Their words are powerful because they are followed by their silent personal example. For they were the first to give away their fortune the first to embrace human pain, as for him, more than anyone else, writes St. Gregory about Basil, he persuaded people neither to scorn people nor to dis dishonor Christ through their inhuman, inhumanity towards others. Their deep love for humankind is concealed with their very deep ever when they condemn heresy, greed, and injustice. Even then, there is no fanaticism or passion. We speak harshly against those in, inclined to snatch and be greedy, not in order to hurt, but in order to correct them, declares St. John Chrysostom. For we despise the evil but not dislike the person, just as the physician who removes all, all ulcer is not fighting the body, but the illness and the injury. End of quote. Their love's horizon is not limited to the people of their city, country, or even church. They recognize that God's love is without boundaries, and so they constantly extend the boundaries of their love in order to embrace all God's children. This ecumenical conscience is manifested in Basil, the great, and his concern for the idolaters of his religion. It is, however, even more apparent 
in Saint John Chrysostom, who is unable to become absorbed by the internal affairs of his ministry, without by any means neglecting the urgent issues of his region, he organizes missionary efforts to Persia, Armenia, Syria, Sicilia, Scythia, among the cults and the gods, and especially in Phoenicia. Even while in exile in the distant Caucasus, and despite his never-ending hardship, he thinks of the abandoned children of God living in idolatry. He subjects himself to all kinds of deprivation in order to send people money and gifts from Antioch and Constantinople to countries where mission is carried out. Quote, if we learned that you left to go there for mission, he writes to the presbyter Gerontios, Please be prepared to do everything for the salvation of the people who reside there, then our joy will be so great that we will forget we reside in the desert. End of quote. That limit their field of vision, separated from everything related to sin, and united with all human beings, the fathers feel all the turmoil of society all the needs and expectations of the world, united with Christ, they sense a deep connection which binds them with every human being for whom Christ did die. This is why they are not simply brilliant minds, but pulsating hearts that identified and sympathize with the drama of humanity. Do everything possible in order to win everyone that, and at least more people. This manner of feeling shows us to the way of liberating ourselves from the confusion, labyrinth of self-selfishness, in which we usually allow our spirituality to evaporate or rather in which we finally lose our own selves, other people and God. Πώς θα συντονιστούμε με τη δυναμική θέλησή τους. <coughs> the Father's strength, stability of will is extraordinary. Their emotions are not merely abstract feelings as they sense the human drama. Rather, they strive for the continuation of Christ's redemptive work. Even as they gain strength from the heavens, they struggle to transform the earth. Quote, we are called to desire the heavens, and all that is in heaven, explains St. Chrysostom. However, even before heaven, he commanded us to make earth into heaven and to live on earth just as we would in heaven. End of all. The three ecumenical fathers are not only men of great vision, but also figures of great accomplishment, of dynamic will. An initial inspiration and emotion were obviously not sufficient for Chrysostom to maintain 3,000 widows on a daily basis in Antioch and from the sea foreigners and imprisoned, and later 7,000 widows in Constantinople. A mere well-thought plan for the organization of the large monastic centers and the Vasilias with the orphanage, hospital, hostels, leper center, schools, and workshops, and their staffing guidance and inspiration by the appropriate personnel was again not enough. Anyone engaged even for a brief time in similar projects knows the persistence, endurance and iron will demanded to coordinate such efforts. Moreover, only those who have experienced theological, ideological struggles can 
appreciate. What kind of persistence and willpower lies behind the accomplishments of St. Gregory, who went to Constantinople at a time where the Arians were in total control, and despite their intrigues and aggression, was able to win them over orthodoxy. To those who are willing, everything is easy, wrote St. John Chrysostom clearly from the personal experience. The three Irons forget this forged, this evolutionary power through their own labors. Gregory and Percy were in isolation and ascesis in Pontus. Chrysostom spent four years in ascesis in the mountains of Antioch. Indeed, even when they worked in the city, they always remained ascetics, precisely as a result of the profound personal element in the father's willful maturity, we can observe a variety in the manner that they operate. The father John displays the strength of his will differently to the always moderate Basil, and again differently to the tranquil manner of the romantic and melancholic Gregory. Nonetheless, one is able to discern in all of them a stable, sure, sober will which renders them. To avoid any disappointment, we now what they encourage many storms and persecutions, slanders and pressures during their own life. Moreover, illness was a constant companion. On one occasion, the horizon was so bleak that St. Gregory wrote, the sea voyages at night and no torch is anywhere to be found. Even Christ is sleeping, and elsewhere he wrote, Woe to me, I am tired, my Christ. O breath of all mortals. Let us hear this in the original Greek. O plus enikti pirsos udamu. Christos kathevdi. And to the leaders. St. John Chrysostom reveals this secret as in a very eloquent way. There is nothing. There is nothing at all that desire cannot overcome. And when this is a desire for God, then it is the noblest kind of desire, transcending all others. Then neither fire, nor war, nor poverty, nor illness, nor death, nor anything similar will frighten whoever possesses this desire. Instead, he will laugh at all these things as he flies to heaven and along with those who live there. He will enjoy the same things and see nothing else, neither heaven nor earth nor the sea, but will only be focused on one beauty, namely the beauty of that glory. Let us therefore fall in love with this desire in the present as well as in the future. Of all these things, the most important is to have Christ as both our beloved and our lover. Ton Christon erromenon echi omu kierasti. I read the whole text. Erastomen tinin tuton tonerta. 
και δια τα παρόντα και δια τα μέλλοντα. Τούτον γάρ απάντων μίζων το των Χριστών ερώμενων έχει ομού και εραστή. Only when we are baptized in the spirit of the great fathers of our church, then we attune our thoughts, hearts and will to theirs. Only then shall we live our Christianity in its fullness and enjoy its eternity, pure beauty. The four points of our lecture were, first, aligning our phronima with the fathers. Second, ease and freedom towards the world. Third, intense awareness of communion and deep love for humanity. And fourth, attuning to their dynamic will. In conclusion, let us change our course towards the spirit of the fathers. This does not imply retreat, but progress. It is about faithfulness to the spirit not a replication of the letter. It is about true continuity of life, thought, and inspiration. The correct motto is not back to the fathers, but forward with the fathers, aligned with the fathers, to advance in this troubled world with spiritual focus, with the purity <coughs> of principles, with love and with joy for all people, with the decisiveness and courage of the children of God, so that we may perceive our time and our times may in turn perceive us as a force of health and hope. Excuse me to repeat this in Greek. Στροφή στο πνεύμα των πατέρων, αυτό δεν σημαίνει οπισθοχώρηση. Σημαίνει πρόοδο. Πρόκειται για μια πιστότητα πνεύματος, όχι για μια αντιγραφή γράμματος. Πρόκειται για μια πραγματική συνέχεια ζωής και σκέψεως και εμπνεύσεως. Το ακριβές σύνθημα δεν είναι πίσω στους πατέρες, αλλά μπροστά με το πνεύμα των πατέρων για να προχωρήσουμε σε αυτόν τον κλονισμένο μας κόσμο με την πνευματική περισυλλογή, αυτή τη γνή, την αγνή, τη γλυκιά αυστηρότητα αρχών με τη γνώση και την αγάπη και τον άνθρωπο με την αποφασιστικότητα και το θάρρος των τέκνων του Θεού για να νιώσουμε την εποχή μας και να μας αισθανθεί και αυτή ως δύναμη υγείας και ελπίδος. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ.